so uh, my mom would have been 74 years old this week. Uh, her name was Kathleen, and she went by Kathy. Uh, she was this kind of person that was just kind and generous, and she would give anybody just anything that they needed. If they needed time, she would sit and take them out for coffee. If they needed resources, she would make sure that they got those resources. She was that kind of faithful, giving person. My mom loved her family so deeply, especially her grandkids, and, and, and she was so devout in her faith and her belief in God. She uh, went to church every Sunday. She volunteered on all the committees. She read her Bible every morning and journaled next to it. She had this really weird, uncanny ability to like see God in everything. And she would just point it out. She'd be like, oh, you see that bluebird? That's God reminding you this. Or do you see this? Uh, that's God reminding you that. You hear that song? That's God reminding you of that. And as I talk about my mom, there's another little part of my mom. Uh, my mom was also goofy. <laughs> Like, like sometimes we were like, oh my gosh, mom, <laughs> like what? I, we were kind of embarrassed by her, by her goofiness. Uh, here's a story about that. One time when I was at work, I was working as a youth director in a church and uh, we had a meeting uh, in my office. My mom and I, we lived in the same town and often we'd get lunch together uh, during the week. But I was in this meeting, this really serious meeting uh, with the director of Christian education and both the senior pastor and the associate pastor about some big changes that we were going to implement in our kid and student program. As we're sitting in this meeting uh, in my office, all of a sudden the door creaks just a little tiny bit open. And we kind of look, thinking that maybe the wind opened it or something like that. Maybe we didn't push it closed all the way. And then all of a sudden, this little tiny piece of PVC pipe makes its way <laughs> into the door. And we're looking like this. And five seconds later, all of a sudden, mini marshmallows are like flying all over <laughs> through this little <laughs> PVC pipe. And all of a sudden, you hear someone go, woo! And then it's jump in. And like all of a sudden, my mom bursts open this door with this marshmallow gun that she had made at Home Depot that morning and, and she thought I was the only person in the office <laughs> and she came in and she was shooting marshmallows all over not even realizing that I uh, am in this really serious meeting she is shooting uh, her pastors my bosses and my boss's boss with marshmallows <laughs> and after she realized that I wasn't in there all alone my mom started gathering up the marshmallows <laughs> she's like oh my gosh I'm so sorry I'm so sorry she's cleaning up all these little marshmallows and then her embarrassment got like the best of her when she realized she had shot the pastors with marshmallows and she grabbed the marshmallows and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go, I have to go. And she like took off. <laughs> and then we were sitting there and I was sitting there with my pastor and, and, and the associate pastor and we're all like, oh, <laughs> what just happened? Like what just happened in the middle of this meeting? So my mom, she was kind and she was real and she was faithful and she was goofy and I miss her every single day. Now today is a day in the church that we call, we call All Saints. It's a time when we come together to be intentional about, about paying attention to the grief and loss that surrounds us every single day. Uh, uh, during All Saints Week, we're reminded that loss and grief, it touches each and every one of our lives. On a day like this, uh, it can seem kind of weird if you're not part of the church, but I would say it's even weirder in our American culture. Let's be honest about being Americans today. We don't do grief very well. When we're grieving, or maybe even if we're grieving too long, we kind of get embarrassed and we're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and we try to pick up the little pieces and, and run out the door. And all the other people are just standing there looking like, oh my gosh, what just happened? In our culture, we actually keep grief sort of locked behind closed doors. We keep it in hospitals and nursing homes. We keep it in funeral homes and sometimes in the church. But, but we're all kind of grieving. The we have the fact that this person, this big thing in our life was here and that now isn't. Most of us are walking around with deep feelings about it, but we don't really talk about it well. We don't make space for it. We don't make it to exist in our modern lives. We don't talk about its impact on us. And this is why uh, in the church here, we do All Saints, because it's important. It's important that we make space to talk about grief and loss in our lives. It's important because most of us, we're walking around carrying some. We're walking around carrying some pain or some loss or some kind of grief or some kind of complicated family dynamics we wish that we could do something about. My friends, the truth is, is that we need to talk about it. Now, Jesus in the Bible, in John chapter 11, Jesus gets word from his friends Mary and Martha, who are living in the city of Bethany, that uh, Jesus' friend, Lazarus, their brother, Lazarus, is sick and is dying. 
But then Jesus doesn't do anything about it. Jesus doesn't go rush to his bedside while he's passing away because Jesus has something else in mind for Lazarus. But Lazarus dies, and I can imagine what Mary and Martha were sitting there thinking when they're holding their dead brother's body about how they believe that Jesus was who Jesus said he was and why Jesus didn't do anything. Jesus didn't even come to them. I can imagine that in their grief, their anger started to grow on top of it. So now Jesus actually makes his way back to Bethany four full days later after Lazarus has died. Four days later, can you imagine what that felt like for Mary and Martha? The Bible says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. You see, Mary, in her pain, she doesn't even want to go and see Jesus. She doesn't even want to go be bothered with this person that didn't bother to show up at her brother's uh, dying bedside. But Martha, she feels differently. She's going to go and she's going to confront Jesus. And she's honestly, she's angry. And she's going to let him have it. She says to Jesus, she goes to the street and says, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. Now Jesus says, where's, where's Mary? And Martha goes and gets her. And, and when Mary hears that Jesus is asking for her, she finally goes to meet him. And then when Mary sees Jesus, she says almost exactly the same thing. She says, Lord, if you'd have not been here, if you'd have been here, then my brother would have not died. The story continues when Jesus saw her weeping, when he saw Mary weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Well, come and see, Lord. And they replied, and Jesus wept. You see, Jesus wept. Jesus grieved, which shows us that grief isn't just normal. Grief is good. Uh, It's good for us to grieve. It is okay for us to grieve. It is good for us to miss and mourn the people who were in our lives that mattered to us. This, my friends, is why we need to talk about it. So today I want to focus a little bit on on the weight of our words, especially in the light uh, of grief. As a pastor, I have had the deep honor of walking with hundreds of families as they've lost their loved ones. And you know what they talk about most? It's not the songs that they're going to play at their funeral or the scripture passages, or it's not the the who's going to go up and give the eulogy. What they talk about the most in those times of grief is the words that that person said to them. The words that that person uh, impacted them. They almost always recount the last words that their partner, their friend, their parent, their grandparent said. It's because our words carry weight. You see, oftentimes when it comes to the weight of our words, it tends to come in in kind of two different categories. It comes in the category of things that we said or were said and things that were unsaid. Now, I want to talk about this first one just for a minute. Things that were said. Uh, when I grew up, um, I heard lots of platitudes about, about things that were said. Things like, uh, sticks and stones may make my bones, but words will never hurt me. Or, actions speak louder than words. Or, when you were a kid, it was like, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever I say, whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. And here's the thing, when I was a kid, I believed these platitudes a little while later, until I realized that, that words, actually, words actually really hurt. I remember when I was in second grade and I spent a week crying when my best friend Kelly, who lived across the street from me, said, "Uh, Angie, I don't want to be your friend anymore. Those words, they broke my heart. Or or when my ex-husband looked at me after seven years together and two children and said, "Uh, Angie, I, I don't love you anymore. Those words hurt. Words impact us. They can be good words. It's like, hey, you're a really good parent, or um, I'm so proud of you, or hey, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Or words like, will you embarrass me tonight? Or you're not needed here anymore. You can't sit here. Words are powerful. Words mark us. Words impact us probably more than anything else. Now it's estimated that, that kids today, they hear about 400 negative words a day. 400 negative words each day. And it's also been researched that in order to get rid of one of those, the impact of one of those negative words, it actually takes five positive words in order to mitigate one negative one. Uh, You know how this works. Uh, You go and you have your job review and you have these five points that say you did really incredible at, you were so good, but then you have that like one like room for growth. Or, or for students, you have like all A's, but then you have that one B minus. Which one is it the one that you obsess over? It's the negative one. So in order to get through these 400 negative words that kids are exposed to every day, uh, it, you have to give them five positive words. That means they have to have 2,000 positive words every single day just to break even. But let's be honest. 
This is not just true for kids, is it? It's true for us adults too, good or bad. The words another person has said to you has made a deep impact on you. The words that other people have given to you have formed how you think of yourself, of your self-esteem, your self-image. It's even formed how you sort of talk to yourself in your own head. But then there's another side of it. It's easier for us to sit there and think about the words that other people have said to us, how these words have hurt us. But what about the words that we have said to other people that hurt them? Uh, when my daughter Mackenzie was right, right in the middle of adolescence, she came downstairs one morning and she was wearing the most crazy outfit. She had on this like poofy green skirt on top of capri cut jeans with these orange striped socks underneath them with some converse on her feet. And on top she had this Kermit the Frog t-shirt. And I looked at her sort of like passive aggressively like, <laughs> and I said, I said, do we have to wear all the colors at once? <laughs> and then I looked in her eyes and she just welled up. She just welled up. She went from this feeling of pride and self-expression to all of a sudden uh, what she wear as wearing wasn't good enough. My friends, I did that. I did that. And that's not, even, that's not even close to the worst thing that I have ever said. You see, the things that we say, they have impact on the people around us. They have meaning. And they just end up becoming defining us. And what, what, what the source of those words actually depends on how much those words weigh. Me, as Mackenzie's mother, those words that I said, that passive aggressive of one statement, it meant so much to her, which is why she had so much emotion about it. The words my best friend in second grade said to me uh, weighed a lot because she was my best friend. The words that my ex-husband said to me meant a lot because he was my husband. You see, people in authority or people who are looked up to, people like parents and teachers and bosses and leaders and older siblings like big brothers and big sisters, their words actually weigh more than other people's words. So the source of these words determine the impact of those words. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was working in my previous congregation, I got up to preach and I knew that there was a guy who uh, was in the church every single week who didn't uh, think that women should be preachers. I knew that he held this view because he kind of told everybody this view. And so it, when it was my turn, I'd get up there and he'd roll his eyes before I even spoke a word to the congregation. Uh, sometimes he'd scroll on his phone or he'd get up and go to the bathroom uh, while I was preaching because he didn't believe that a woman could ever preach a sermon. And he told everyone around it. There was one day where this same guy he came up to me after church and he said to me a comment about my sermon. He started with, hey, uh, no offense, which, by the way, if somebody's going to start a comment with no offense, it means that they're definitely about to offend you. And then he told me something that he didn't like about the message. But here's the thing. It didn't even bother me at all because his words held no weight for me because we didn't have a relationship. It was the source of those words that meant that they didn't hold any weight for me. But on the other hand, my mom, my mom, when we knew that she was dying of brain cancer and we sat with there and we knew that she only had a couple of days left, uh, maybe two or three at the most, she was on this high flow of oxygen because her lungs were failing and it was really, really hard for her to breathe. My mom, she looked at me crying and she said, between those deep breaths, she said, hey Angie, grab a pen and paper. And so I went and I got a pen and paper and she said, okay, write this down. I said, okay, okay, I got it, Mom. She said, okay, keep God first, wrote it down. She said, call your siblings once a week, and I wrote it down. She said, make the world a better place. Okay, okay, don't go to bed angry. Okay, okay, write thank you notes. And I looked at her and I said, Mom, 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 you taught me all of this. You taught me all of this. I know this in my whole being. And then my mom, she started to cry, and she said something I'll never forget. She said, Angie, she goes, what if I didn't do enough? Which was so surprising to me because I couldn't imagine anyone possibly having done more with their years that they were given. I said, Mom, uh, uh, what do you mean? She said, I mean enough for, uh, meaning she meant heaven. And I couldn't imagine. You see, those words that my mom said that changed my life. How on earth could my goofy, kind, faithful, God-fearing mom feel like she hadn't done enough for heaven? The source of the words means that those words weigh more. You see, the source of the words matter. Pastor Andy Stanley puts it this way. He says, the source of the words determines the weight of the words. And the weight of the words determines the impact. And the impact of those words determines the outcome, determines how much we internalize those as part of our being. 
You see, the source, the parent, the child, the boss, the grandparent, the best friend determines how much those words weigh. And, and then the person receiving that words, that weight r- determines the impact. And then that impact determines how much we are going to put those into part of our personal permanent record of things that we replay to ourselves over and over again in our head. You see, Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, he kind of tries to make this point, and he says it this way. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who will listen. What Paul is trying to say here is unless it builds people up according to their needs, not according to our needs, according to what they need in order to build them up, that the intention behind our words matters. If the intention is just to to gain some control or to satisfy our ego or have our needs met, then we're missing out on what Paul is saying here in Ephesians. But if our attention is for them, according to their needs, for those benefit, realizing that our words carry weight. And then oftentimes, uh, maybe just as equally impactful, there's the second category. There's these things that were left unsaid. You see, in grief and loss, people will sometimes tell me what they, what they never said to their loved one. They'll sit there and say, like, I never got to tell him how much I loved him, or I never got to tell him how much this experience meant to me, or I didn't get to tell him how that thing that they did, how that changed exactly who I am, and I want them to know there's these things that left unsaid. You and I, we both know people who are still trying to prove something to their dad or their mom or to their boss, whoever it was that didn't say the things that they needed to hear all their lives. Those people who never heard the words, I'm proud of you, or I love you, or I see you and I hear you. They spent all their lives trying to find that approval or that affection. Think about how the great lengths that people will go to try and fulfill that need, that longing of the thing unsaid. We'll exhaust ourselves trying to hear those words that we never heard. See, the words that we don't say actually have weight too. Because our words matter, both the ones we say and the words we don't say. As I looked at my mom, uh, and and she was crying, Uh, she was worried that she hadn't done enough. And I said, Mom, I don't think that any of us could do enough for heaven. But what happened there was that those words, that exchange right there, it changed me. And it actually changed how I understood Jesus. It changed how I understood the power and the depth and the width of God's grace. And then it changed how I lived my life because I don't want anyone ever to feel that way. I don't want anyone to ever worry that they haven't done enough for God who does everything for us. Uh, It's become a passion and a mission and a ministry of mine to make sure that people know just how exactly enough they are. So friends, this All Saints, let's remember that our words have weight on the people around us. Some of them are hurting and some of them are grieving and and, and maybe you don't even know. I love this quote that says, be kind because everyone is fighting a hard battle. But friends, I wanna close with this. I wanna give you some words that are absolutely 100% true about you. Play it over and over again until you believe it down to your core. And, and they come from the source that matters the most. You know, you may say that you're washed up, but God says, no, no, you are a new creation. You may say that you're scarred, but God says, no, you are healed. You may think that you're too weak to get through this moment, but God says that you are strong. You may recognize that you've hurt other people, you've hurt some people you love, but God says, you know what, don't carry that in anymore because you are forgiven. You may think that you're too broken, but God says, no, no, I don't think you understand. I have made you whole. You think that you're alone, and God says, you know what? You're never going to be alone. You may think that you need to hustle and go gain that approval, that that, that love that you've been looking for. God says, no, you can can stop now because I've got you covered. You can say that you're worthless, but you can remember that Jesus died for you to show you that you're absolutely worth everything. You can believe that uh, you're not enough for God, but God says, you know what, you're going to be forever loved. And you can say like your pain, your grief, your heartache is just too much. And then God says to you, hey, let me carry that for you. I promise I've got you. Friends, these are the words that matters the most. It's because of the source who's got you through all of it. Amen.
Will you please pray with me the prayer that our Lord taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hey, my friends, if you want to come here to church and hear some uplifting words, especially if you're a woman, we would love for you to come to our women's brunch. Our theme this year is Brave. It's going to be on November 9th from 9 until 11 here at the church. You can go on our website, calvaryalex.org, and register. We also have a, a great event coming up here on November 17th. It's called Surviving the Holidays. Some of us, all of us, we have layers in our families. Uh, we have layers of grief. We have layers layers of hurt. We have layers of expectation. And so what we're going to do is invite you to come to the church that night on November 17th to meet with some professional counselors as well as some of our caring ministry staff to talk about how can we strategize going into Thanksgiving, going into Christmas season with a different posture. We're going to give you some tools and equip you for that. You can find more information on that same website. We're going to close with a time of generosity. Uh, we're so grateful. We're so grateful that you come together as a community to continue to support and care for each other. And we couldn't do this without your generosity. There's four ways that you can give, and they're on your screen. The first is that you can go to that website, calvaryalex.org, click on the button that says Give. The second is you can use our Venmo handle at Calvary Church Alex. The third is you can write a check and mail it to the church at 605 Douglas Street, Alexandria, Minnesota, 56308. And the fourth is you can call the church with the number on your screen, and we'll help you get it figured all out. Thanks for being here today.